Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast. Today in episode 35, I'm going to be talking a little bit about springtime on the farm. Now this is the first time that I really feel like we can call what we have here a farm because we did get a few new animals. Things actually escalated pretty quickly here in the last week, so I thought that would be a good topic to talk about. My name is Lisa, mom of six and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Last time I talked to you, I said that we we're going to be getting goats. Actually, I think maybe the last episode when Luke was on, we already had them. But my friend Stephanie, she lives over down the road in the same town as me. She blogs over at Hopewell Heights. She brought by two of her goats because we had agreed that I wanted one of her dairy goats. And this particular goat was at the time expecting kids and I knew that goats needed a hooved companion or I didn't really know but she told me that they don't do very well at all without a companion and so we decided that I would take two of her goats and just return one whenever we acquired another one which I think we're going to buy another one from her coming this fall. So she brought them by and the very next day not that same night which we were kind of thinking but the very next day we woke up to three kids, three baby goats. We weren't really sure if we were going to be, well, I was sure that I wanted to milk something and that I wanted animals here because I grew up on a farm and I just feel comfortable in that environment. But Luke wasn't sure how he would like having all these animals here. We both agreed that that was really exciting. It was so much more exciting than I expected. I see on Instagram whenever somebody lives on a farm and their cow is expecting or their goats and they post every day like a baby watch photo and I never quite could grasp the level of excitement that they are feeling but it is so exciting to go out there and see new life on your farm. Hey buddy, including you. <laughs> so that happened probably about a week ago. Turns out we had two little bucks and a doe. I had to do a quick Google search on how you could tell what they were and it was pretty easy to tell. Another thing that happened is we got someone's barn cats about a year ago. I think it was last May maybe or April. There was someone that lives near my parents had a barn full of cats and they were trying to get rid of them and of course my kids talked me into it. We came home with three female cats and I showed this on my YouTube channel. Here's the reason why I have not shared this anywhere. I don't know why I feel like I can share more here in my podcast but I do. Whenever I put them on my YouTube channel I had full intentions that we were going to take them in to the Humane Society and get them fixed and really truly I meant to but time got away from me and apparently cats move on really quickly with their lives. To make the long story short, we now are the proud owners of about 14 little kittens. So yes, the problem will become exponential and we will fix the cats. I now realize how quickly that became a problem. Cats aren't good with the bird population and they multiply really fast. But nonetheless, we have so many kittens just from two of the cats because one of them, one of the ki cats we took home didn't make it. They were kittens last year this time. I mean, brand new baby kittens. So I really truly didn't expect that they would get pregnant that fast. They did. On top of that, okay, so another thing, this, this has all happened in the last week, which is why just things have escalated very quickly. My parents own a feed store. It's pretty close by to where we live. And they had a cat hanging around because this is the thing when you live on a farm, or you have you know, any, like a feed store, anything in a rural area, you end up with cats. Like when I was growing up, my parents, I mean, we had, we lived on 400 acres. We had cats going around our house all the time. Like I even put it in the foreword of my book that one of the most exciting things for me as a kid was figuring out which cat was pregnant and then anxiously awaiting the babies. Like seeing a cat get fatter and fatter, and then all of a sudden skinny and then going to find the babies is one of my favorite childhood memories. So having rogue cats when you live on a farm is just par for the course. I know it's one of those things I have to explain and it, it sounds crazy to people who didn't grow up that way, but there just are always cats around. And my parents never did anything with the cats. They just they just were around. We never took any to the vet or anything like that. Now, with us living on such a small amount of property, 
I am going to take that consideration more seriously because I can see, I can do the math. I can see that if we don't do anything, we're gonna have like 50 cats in a year and I definitely don't want that. But my parents at their feed store, they had a cat hanging around. She gave birth about four weeks ago to five kittens. Well, we got a call a week ago that there was a whole bunch of mewing kittens and a dead cat on the road. So the mama cat was hit by a car. She left behind five nurslings. So the day before our first cat gave birth to kittens, we went and picked up a few of those kittens to feed and nurse with the milk replacement for cats, okay? That exact same day, one of our cats gives birth to seven kittens. Now we suspected she was pregnant, but we didn't really inspect closely. Same day that happened. And then about four days later, which was about two days ago now-ish, the other cat had, we think four, but here's the funny thing about it. They're confused. They can't figure out whose is whose. So whenever we look in the garage where they all are, there is one mama cat with three or four that are a week old and then a couple that are brand new. And then the other cat has a mixture as well. So we realized after feeding the four week old cat from the feed store a bottle for a week, we realized that the other two cats that we actually have were getting their babies confused. We decided to put the four week old baby cat kitten out there with the other two moms to see if maybe they wouldn't notice. And sure enough, she's nursing the mom. One of the moms is licking her and now she feels a lot more comfortable. She's been in our house for the past week, just mewing like crazy in our kitchen. The kids feed her bottles every four hours and she just honestly didn't seem very happy because she's all alone without any cats. And now she's just cuddled up with that mommy cat and seems perfectly content. And she is also nursing, which is much better than a replacement. So there is what's going on on the cat front here. Now the, those don't contribute at all to the homestead. I do love cats, but um, we're gonna have to control that cat population a little bit. We're gonna have to fix some cats because that's not gonna ha that's not gonna work. Now, as far as the goats, Luke and I over the last four weeks or so have been working on putting up fencing around our barn. So when we moved to this property, we acquired a turn of the century, actually a little bit older than even turn of the century because this house uh, was built in the 1860s and we imagine the barn was built around the same time. Uh -huh. So a turn of the century white barn and an old brick silo and it all has always looked so beautiful sitting there but whenever we put goats in the barn, uh -huh. we fenced in a little section that comes out of one of the barn doors. It meets up with the silo and now there's animals in the place where they should be in the barn. The view is just so incredibly, it's romantic to me. I grew up when I look out the window seeing animals and now our bedroom window and the kitchen window overlook, they overlook the north part of the farm and they look out to where the barn and the silo and the goats are. And I knew I wanted this kind of thing, but now that it's here, it all just feels so much more complete to be utilizing the barn how it should be. So now we have five goats. I lost track of the cats and then we just picked up some more chickens. So we currently use a chicken tractor that we built from Green Willow Acres or Homestead plans last year. And it holds up to 20 chickens. And the purpose of it, if you are brand new and this all is just new to you and you wanna get into something small in your backyard, the purpose of a chicken tractor like that, it is the place where the chickens have a shelter. So it has a separate area where they can go up, lay their eggs, they can be put up at night to be safe from predators. But then also the bottom is open and you move it around your yard every day so they have fresh access to bugs and grass. So even people who live on big properties will use chicken tractors They'll keep several of them if they want to raise, you know, a hundred birds. And then people who live on small properties, like we did before on a quarter acre, can utilize a chicken tractor. So we currently have 11 hens, 
that are laying, they're a year old, in the chicken tractor that we built last year that Luke moves every single day around our property. And then about a month ago, we picked up four Americana pullets from the feed store because I wanted blue eggs. So that's why we got some Americanas. And then last week, the day after we went and got the cat, we went back up to the feed store and we got, uh, they had a chick days and we got 15 more pullets. We ordered them from Cackle Hatchery. My family's feed store had a chick days, but they ordered from Cackle Hatchery because I wanted some more of the rarer breeds. Currently our full grown laying hens are Leghorns and Plymouth Rocks. Now, if you're brand new to this and you just want high egg production, Leghorns are the way to go. Even during the winter, they were the most likely to lay. They lay a white egg and we would always see white eggs, whereas it seemed like the Plymouth Rock took a little bit more of a break. So that's the way to go. But see, the reason we added to our flock this year and why I ordered special from the hatchery is I wanted a more diverse egg basket. There's just something about heading out to the coop and gathering a basket of brown, white, blue, pink, dark brown eggs. It's just something that I'm really excited to do this year. So from the hatchery, we ordered French Black Copper Morans, Olive Eggers, Easter Eggers, and Well Summers. We obviously cannot fit all of these hens into the chicken tractor because if you've been keeping track, we have our 11 full grown birds, we have our 15 tiny, tiny pullets that are about two weeks old, if even that at this point, and then we have the one month old Americanas. And the size difference between all of these is very, very different. I would say the Americanas probably fall right in the middle of the tiny, tiny pullets that you see whenever you go to Orchelin or Tractor Supplier when they're having chick days, and then in between the full grown. That's where the Americanas are. Now they're at that stage now where you don't necessarily have to have a heat lamp on them at all times. So I've been taking them out every day and putting them in with the goats. This was an idea for my friend Stephanie. I've never kept chickens and goats. When I grew up on a farm, we had cattle and we had elk. And then, as you know, a bunch of cats and a couple of dogs. So we didn't really have a diverse, it was more like you had an elk pen and that's where you kept the elk and the elk calves. And then you had a cattle pen. I've never been on this type of farm where you grow a little bit of everything, which is the goal that we have here with veggies and eggs. And eventually I want to do meat and milk. We're just branching in all of it. Every day I've been taking the Americana and putting them out there with the goats. That gives them some sunshine. They can pick around for different greens and grass and bugs. And they're really enjoying that arrangement. And then I just go put them back in at night um, in the We've been, keep, we've been using our little red cottage as a brooder. So if you follow me on Instagram, right out of the front of our house, I have photos of it, you'll see a red cottage. And eventually we wanna make that over, make it, you know, it has plumbing, it has a bathroom and a bed, and it could be a neat little guest cottage, but right now, since we haven't done that, it's been a perfect brooder. So we have a galvanized tub in there with our 15 chicks and a heat lamp. And then now the Americanas, we just put them in a tote at night in there with food and water. They don't really need the heat lamp anymore. We found that when we did have them all together, they would move away from the heat. And that's when you know that they don't really need the heat anymore. So they're perfectly content to be out in the sunshine during the day with the goats. And it's so much fun to watch the little baby goats interact with the chicks. Just seeing all of that on the side of this 18, probably 60s or I don't know, an 1890s barn is beyond exciting for me. And by the way, I never knew that goats hop when they're babies. But if you ever get the opportunity to witness baby goats, they are the actual cutest thing ever. They're way small, smaller than I expected. Now we have a mini Sonnen. Her babies, I forgot, I'm, I'm gonna have to ask Stephanie again what they were bred with, but they're mixed with something even smaller. So the mama goat is already really small and then the babies are going to be even smaller as adults. So they are really small. Like they're smaller than our cats. They're tiny and they're just the cutest little things. They make these tiny little bleating noises and they hop. 
So in about, I would say another week or so, we're going to separate the babies just at night. In our barn area, we have a little building that connects the barn to the silo. It's a nice little enclosure, predator proof. We're going to put the three kids in there overnight. They'll nurse all day long throughout the day. I'll separate them around eight or 9 p.m. at night. And then in the morning, I will milk Miss Jenny, that's the mama, and then I'll put them back together. That will yield about a half gallon of milk per day, which by the way, I am so excited to milk something. I have wanted a dairy something for so long, and I think this will be the really perfect way to get started with this. We might eventually get dairy cows, but I want to get familiar and used to milking every single day, getting to where I am used to that commitment, and then also just good get, getting good at the actual milking process. And if I feel like we can take on more, like I want more milk, I want to make, you know, so many more things, we might eventually get a dairy cow or milk several goats. Now, before that happens, Luke needs to build me a milk stand, which I've looked up tutorials online and they're super simple. And then I'm going to get a milk bucket because I've heard from many farmers that you will not get any milk for the first couple of weeks because you'll, you will be so bad at it that your animal will step in it and spill it or you'll spill it and that it's just way trickier than it sounds. So I'm of course hoping that I can get my setup so that I don't actually waste a lot of milk. Now with the goat milk, we typically do drink about a half gallon a day so we won't have a whole lot extra, but I'm planning to make goat milk kefir, goat milk yogurt and cheese. So that is something coming and I just am so excited. Something about gathering food from your own property. I remember feeling this same feeling when even when we lived on a quarter acre. I put in a garden, we had our chickens. It just felt so amazing to go out in the backyard with my big basket and fill it to the top with vegetables and eggs and herbs. I mean, nothing is as essential to human life as food. So it does totally make sense that it'd be satisfying to cultivate, tin, bake. I also really love the connection that I'm building with food to my kids because we all know where food comes from, but I do find that we're amazingly distant from it, especially when we don't really go much beyond the grocery stores at all. Even if you're not going to grow everything, you know, you might grow just a few things, but finding local farms and building that connection, I love that. And especially if I can do it in my own backyard, I'm gonna be even more excited about it. I was just posting about this yesterday on Instagram and it seemed to strike a chord with a lot of people because I had so many comments about their own experiences with this. But I posted that a lot of this farm life just doesn't make sense because you can always go to the grocery store and get vegetables and get milk and get butter and cheese and eggs. You don't have to do this at all. You can buy every last bit of it at the store, but it tastes better. It's just something about it. Whenever you have to learn how to do it, make your own loaf of bread, can and preserve and ferment. It just, something about it, the satisfaction of feeding that is, to your family is just more than you can imagine. But one thing that I absolutely love about living in modern times is I love that you don't have to depend on it because there's times when in life that are just too busy and you just can't and it just stresses you out even more than how beneficial it is to actually do it. It's nice that you don't have to, but I do challenge you to learn something, try something, even if it is just growing a little raised bed in your backyard, just try it and see how that food tastes whenever you've taken it from a seed and then grown it all the way into a tomato or an herb. It's it's amazing. And I've never brought in from my own property milk and that is something I cannot wait to do. Okay, on the veggies note, another thing that we've been doing, last week Luke built four more raised beds. Now last year, we built six raised beds from cedar fence pickets. At the time, we were just trying to get something up really quick because we Moved in in January, we started, you know, we settled in and we just, by the time it was garden season, we didn't have anything built and we didn't have a garden plot and I was like, we just need to get this done. So we picked up a whole bunch of cedar fence pickets. I put the tutorial on my blog, but it was so easy. We just 
basically used some two by fours as support corners and we built these raised beds and then we just ordered a load of topsoil from the nursery and planted in that. But this year we pulled down the garden cottage that was there because it was beyond repair. If you saw the video on my YouTube channel, you know it truly was beyond repair because I know that some people are going to be upset with me for tearing it down, but trust me, if anything's salvageable, I'm not tearing it down. I will not do it. That's why we bought an 1860s house. So now that we tore that down, we had room for more raised beds. We built larger ones. So we have six three feet by six feet raised beds on the outsides of the garden that are built from the cedar fence pickets. And then in the center of the garden, we have eight foot by four foot beds built from cedar decking. Now we went with cedar because it is rot resistant. You can use treated pine, but I like with raised beds, you know, you don't really want that treated chemical to go into the dirt. We built them just about exactly like we did the smaller ones, only it's just with more substantial wood. Now going back, I probably would build all of our raised beds with cedar decking versus the fence pickets because the fence picket ones, they are still holding up, but in a year's time, they're pretty weathered, but they are still lasting now and they probably will for at least five years and they were like 15 bucks each to make. So there's that. They're really cheap. Whereas the decking ones are an inch thick versus a half inch thick and they're a lot more expensive, but I think they'll last pretty much forever. So that's another thing we've done. We also transferred out all of the seedlings I had going in our windowsill. I've been growing quite a few different things uh, since February in our, in our south facing window. And I spent a few days hardening them off. I didn't do a whole lot with that. I just brought them out and let them sit in the sun for a little bit and then I picked really calm days to transfer them, just hoping for the best. And then now for the final project I'll talk about today on here, Luke is at the hardware store picking up lumber for a picket fence that we're going to be building around the garden. So we're going to have a gate at the front that he's gonna build out of pickets, a gate at the back. It's a 40 foot by 26 foot garden rectangle by our barn, so. We're gonna be fencing that all in. There's going to be an arbor at the front eventually, probably not even this year, but I am so excited. The last few weeks have reminded me why we even moved here because in January and February, everything was all gross looking outside and all we really had was a few dreams of getting the garden going and adding more raised beds and tearing down the cottage and dreams of getting fencing up and getting goats and dreams of more chicks. All in the last couple weeks, the, the planning that we did for all that and the dreaming, it's all come together and now the garden cottage is down, the four new raised beds are built, the goats are fenced in. The side of the barn is fixed. We worked on that too. The way Luke and I typically like to do projects around the farm or even in the house in the wintertime is we pick one thing for the week and then anytime we have any extra time at all, that's what we're working on. So one week for an entire week, we worked on fixing the side of the barn, which that vlog is coming out soon. So if you want to watch that over on YouTube, you can see how the side of the barn really sagged and the bottom of the boards were all rotted and it just looked really ugly. We replaced all of that. We had two stumps grinded because there were some old tree stumps by there that I couldn't plant anything because they were in the way. We took care of everything on the side of the barn. That was one whole week's project. And then another week, the entire week, we learned how to do the fencing, Luke built corner posts, and we learned how to stretch fence. And by the end of that, and that might've ran more than a week actually, but you know, for mostly that's what we focused on. By the end of that, within just a week or two, we had fencing for the goats. And then with the raised beds all last week, that was the project. It was making raised beds, leveling out the ground, ordering in some more topsoil that was all accomplished. And then this week it will be working on the picket fence. And then next week, I think we're going to be working on the red cottage a little bit. That'll be that week's project, but that's typically what we do. We just pick one thing to focus on for that week because there's a million things, but we find that we get a lot done if we focus on one thing because after you know five weeks, that's five things. It just is a slow and steady process. And then 
you know, if you work outside the home, you're going to probably have to make that this month. We'll focus on that. But even still, imagine what you'll have done in a year, because I feel like the biggest problem with any project, anything we do around here, it is always getting started and overthinking it and thinking that you don't have enough time to do it. But what if you said in May, we are going to say that you have always wanted to have chickens, but in the back of your mind, like, yeah, then we'd have to build a coop. We'd have to research what breeds. And then it just sounds overwhelming and you don't do it. What if you said in May, anytime we have extra time, we're going to work on that. Even if it is the first day, all you do is look up chicken coop plans. That was something. The next day you go and you buy the materials for it. The next day you nail a few boards together. The next day you research breeds and you order from a hatchery. It just takes a little bitty bit of momentum to make these things happen. And we find that anytime we focus on one thing at a time, we can do it. So the other day, for example, I was up in my girl's room and I hate how it's laid out. I've always hate how it's laid out. It's it's a nice, huge room. But when we moved here, we just put everything in there. We put the bed over in the corner, the desk over here. It's very inefficient. We have one dresser for all their stuff, so they just shove things in there. We need a couple of wardrobes in there, like some armoires. We need to redo the bathroom. We need to get them their own beds because in our last house, a trundle fit, but in this house, we could fit two beds. And it just, I can imagine exactly how to make that room better. But as soon as I start thinking about all that we have to do outside, and then I think about throwing on top of that a massive room makeover, I shut down and I don't wanna do anything. So I instantly filed that one away and, I, and said, you know, we can live with this room as long as we just keep it fairly clutter free and we clean it regularly until the winter time. I am not thinking or focusing on this. I even was like on Pinterest a couple days looking at beds and looking at a few things. Instantly my mind's overwhelmed because I'm now designing a room as if this has to happen now. And then as soon as I shut that off and filed it away until next winter, you feel this sense of relief. So limit any Googles, Pinterest search, talking to friends, about the thing, whatever it is, until you're working on it and then put your whole attention onto one project at a time. That was a major side rant here whenever I'm just sharing what's going on on our farm, but that is how I've gotten anything done in the last four or five years with kids, with business, with decorating, with homestead stuff is always that singular focus mentality. All right, well, that is what is going on on our farm right now here in the spring. Let me know, tag me over on Instagram. What is going on on your farm, in your home, whatever it is, what are you focusing on? What are you working on? I hope you're just enjoying the sunshine. Spring is, I was telling Luke the other day, if you're going to get into this homestead stuff and you're going to get goats to milk, get them in the spring because never in any other season do I have this energy that I have right now. I I'm so excited to go milk those goats. And then by winter, I will be used to it. I'll have the whole flow down and things aren't as fun. I'm gonna be, have to be putting on a coat and boots to go out there and milk those animals. And I'm sure that it'll be way more challenging then, but at least by then I'll have the flow, I'll know what I'm doing. Same with the chickens. You know, if you're gonna try something, Try it right now when when you go outside, it's comfortable. The sun is shining now. I know it's supposed to rain tomorrow. I'm on a high of sunshine right now. All right, for today's random Instagram question, this one seems very on topic for today's topic. I've heard chickens will destroy the yard. True or false in your urban homestead experience? Absolutely true. That is why I need a chicken tractor. I've seen people build a coop and then build a little run. That's fine, but that run will be dirt within a month if it's even if it's a pretty good size run chicken tractor you move it around every day and then in the summer when luke's outside he'll move it around twice a day that is the only way that they won't destroy your yard because they only have half the day to peck around on that grass and to ruin it and to over fertilize it because fresh poop is too hot for grass but if you move it, if you have a chicken tractor and you move it around every day so they always have fresh access, they won't. All right, well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Simple Farmhouse Life. If you have not yet grabbed my 50 plus page farmhouse favorite sourdough recipe ebook with all my sourdough recipes, you can grab that at bit.ly slash farmhouse sourdough. See you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast.